Well, good morning, everybody. We're certainly excited to have you guys out here with us. And I want to encourage you, if you would like to be water baptized today, to take part of it. So one of the things that I love about how we do water baptism is that for many of you who go through that process, it is spontaneous, uh, meaning you didn't plan it. You saw we offered it, and you decided to jump into it. Now, all water baptism is is an outward sign of an inward work. So when we get born again, How many of you know God, with his great grace, forgives all of our past? Oh, come on, every bit of your mistakes. Can we give it up for Jesus? Amazing. And so we know, like, when we go under the water, that's what we're saying is, like, my past is over. Like, we even have had double water baptisms at the same time with a father and a son who were holding offense to each other. Isn't that awesome? A holding offense towards each other, get water baptized, and just say, you know what? What happened in the past is over. God's doing something new in this relationship. We've had a husband and wife rededicate their marriage that way by saying, you know, everything in the past, they were on the verge of divorce, and they said, you know, everything in the past, It is washed away, and today we come up new again. Because water baptism is an outward sign of an inward work. It's saying that the past is over. And maybe some of you, especially starting out a new year, it's like, you know what? I, I want to just show myself that my past is over and to use this as kind of like a turning point for me. I might get in today to just put that saint's loss behind me from last weekend, like the last two postseasons where we have been robbed by the officials <laughs> to put it behind me and to come up new again, ready for a new season. Drew Brees, please come back. So anyway... My point is, is we know when we go under, it's like saying the past is washed away, but when I come up, it's a new season, and it's symbolic of what I believe. Uh, God wants to do something new in your life. You know, Jesus says, behold, I do a new thing. Will you not perceive it? And I think it's just us saying the past is over and a new day is beginning. So if you're here today and you want to be water baptized, you can. Somebody says, well, what about my hair? We got hair stuff. Somebody says, what about my clothes? We got clothes we'll give you, shorts, T-shirt, all those things. Well, somebody says, well, where would I change? You can change in private. We got a tent and then tents in the tent uh, for your own personal, you know, privacy, all those things. We have taken away any excuse you could make for not getting water baptized. You can be water baptized today right here. And as he said, we have a class called Following Jesus. Text FJ to 313131. You can also text sign up to 313131. And what Following Jesus is, is a life group that meets every single Sunday at the 10 o'clock and the 1130 service in the Following Jesus room. So right after this service, you can go to the 1130 service and Following Jesus if you want to. uh, And go over there and be around people who are going to teach you to follow Jesus. You know, and and I know I'm going to take some time with this, but let me just do it. So oftentimes, especially when a new year starts, it's like, I'm going to make myself something awesome this year. Have you ever done that before? It's like, I'm going to make myself something. I'm going to make myself disciplined. I'm going to make myself focused. I'm going to make myself go to the gym. I'm going to make myself stop spending so much money on credit cards. I'm going to make me something awesome. And and here's what I would say is, how well has that worked for you? How'd that work in 2019? How'd that work in 2018? No, you are the clay. He is the potter. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. Follow me and I will make you. And the secret to life is learning how to give Jesus your attention. And the problem is, is that oftentimes we don't know how. That's what following Jesus is. It's going to teach you the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. When you read your Bible, how do you read it? What about the Holy Spirit? What role does he play in my life? And it's in a small group setting as well where you get to ask questions. Uh, and all of those kinds of things. So I want to encourage you, if you're new to the faith, new to church, recently made a decision for Christ, want to rededicate your life, want something new, want to be made into something different, following Jesus is the class for you every Sunday, 10 o'clock, 1130, in the following Jesus room. We'd love to have you out there. Well, we're excited to have all of you guys here with us today, but we also have some people watching online and by television. Uh, We've got someone all the way from Nepal, uh, Laco from Nepal. We've got Heather from Tuskegee, Alabama. We've got Roy from Texas and many others watching online. Can we give it up for everybody watching online? 
Super excited to have you guys tune in with us. Well, today we're going to talk about the power of fasting. And I know everyone is like pumped up about that. I didn't grow up fasting. And in fact, like I grew up in church, uh, but I didn't really hear a ton about fasting. But the older I get and the more scripture I read, the more powerful I see fasting is. It's all throughout scripture. And today I want to talk about it. So before we do, I'll just give you a definition of what kind of I view fasting as. It is the discipline of temporarily, not for a lifetime, but temporarily pulling back from what is desirable to give more of yourself to what is powerful. It is temporarily pulling back from what is desirable to give more of myself to what is powerful. So how many of you know all of us in here have some desirable things? Anybody ever find food desirable? Come on, somebody. I mentioned going to Hershey last week, uh, uh, like took my son to, to Hershey, Pennsylvania, where the Hershey factory is. The candy comes right off the conveyor belt. So like when you eat the peanut butter cup, and you take the brown wrapper off of the cup itself, you can still see the peanut oil in the, it's so fresh. Any of you like fresh candy? Come on, somebody. Isn't it different when it's fresh? Like, you ever found, like, a Reese's Desirable, like, something like that? It's like, okay, we find food desirable. What about Netflix? Any of you ever found Netflix desirable? Uh, Amazon uh, television app, have you ever found it desirable? Sports, watching, uh, you know, uh, football. Have you ever found yourself, like, anxiously waiting to get home to watch fill in the blank. It's desirable, or maybe it's a video game, like you find it desirable, or an app on your phone, you find it desirable. What fasting is, is pulling away from those things temporarily to give more of myself to what is powerful. Now, what do I mean by powerful? Meditation is powerful. It's not easy, because most powerful things aren't easy. Meditation is powerful, pulling away to give more of my time, the time that I would spend watching TV, I give my, my mind over into Scripture, like meditating Scripture. Coming to church is powerful. Prayer is powerful. Reading Scripture is powerful. So I'm pulling away from the desirable to give more of my time and attention to what is powerful. And I want to encourage you to not just do it like now. I want you to fast more than you have ever fasted in 2020 until you come to love it. Like, I want 2020 to be the year of the fast for you, where it's like, I just, what, you know what I did in 2020? I fasted. Fasted what? Fasted a lot of stuff. Fasting is not like not eating. That's dieting. That's a different message. <laughs> Fasting is not just like not watching television. That's showing discipline. Fasting is saying the time, attention, and, and mind, desire, time that would go towards those things, I'm pulling back from that to give more of myself to what is powerful. It is not being hungry. It is filling up on something different. It is filling up on something powerful. Amen. So well, I want to talk about fasting today. Uh, I want to give you three reasons why you should fast more than you've ever fasted before in 2020. And the first one is this. Your flesh is dangerous when it's out of control. Have you ever noticed this? Your flesh is dangerous when it's out of control. I want to ask you today to open up your Bibles with me. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. They'll also put it up on the screens. And today, if you don't have a Bible at all, no worries if you come to the altar and ask for a Bible at the end of the service, they would be happy to give you a Bible. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to look specifically today at verse number 27. This is the Apostle Paul writing. This is a man who wrote three-fourths of your New Testament. This is a man who saw visions of Jesus, like the Lord Jesus personally appeared to him in a vision and taught him the power of communion, like all of these amazing things. This guy walked with God and watch what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27. But I keep under my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, I find this amazing that this guy who was so spiritual, like that guy who's so amazing, has to say the following, I have to keep under my body, I have to bring it into subjection. What he's saying is like, even in my body, I have noticed my body tends to get out of control. Your body ever gotten out of control before? 
Have you ever like, you know what, I'm going to watch an episode. And then all of a sudden it's like, how is it two in the morning right now? And you're like, you're six episodes in because your body can get out of control. So ah, I'll play for, you know, a couple of games on the Xbox. I'll just play for a little bit. It's like, how in the world did I forget to eat? Like I fasted and didn't even mean to because I got so caught up in this game. Have you ever like, you know, had your phone get out of control? Maybe. Maybe, okay, five of you, right? Come on now, right? Like, have you ever had, like, an app get out of control? Like, oh, I'll just kind of check in an hour later, and it's like, how did I spend that much? Did any of you, when, like, the time bill came out where you could see on your battery life, like, on your phone, how much time you gave stuff, did any of you have, like, this moment where it's like, how did I spend that amount of time today on that? Here's why. Your body, if it's desirable, gets out of control. This is not a you thing. This is a humanity thing. Like Paul said, even me, like I am this guy who walks with God. I'm this guy who likes writing scripture. And I'm telling you, I have noticed the tendency for my body to get out of control. And I have to make sure that I put under my body that I do not allow my body to get out of control for us today and our society with how much Netflix I watch, with how much food I eat. I'll not let my body get out of control with how much time I spend on Facebook. I'm not going to allow my body to get out of control on how much television I watch. I'm not going to let my body get out of control with how much, you know, movies I watch or whatever it may be. It's like I know my body can have this moment where it gets out of control, and here's what Paul's saying, is if it gets out of control, it's going to hurt me and limit my potential. He said, I've noticed, like, if I don't keep under my body and bring it into subjection, it will lead me telling you how to run your life, but it will lead my life over into a place of failure. He said, I know I have to keep my body under. Now, I was reading the life of Samson just for fun uh, because Samson is like this amazing person in Scripture, and we see all of his strengths but also all of his failings. And I noticed something that I had never quite seen before when I read the story. And you know the, how it goes. Samson is just rocking life, and finally Delilah comes and is like trying to understand the secret of his power. And his head is on her lap, and she comes up to him and, and, and tries to figure out how to do it. But the reason why she's coming to try to find out the secret of his power is what happened to, uh, before this. The Philistines come to Delilah and tell her the following in the book of Judges. Judges 16 and verse 5. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, entice him and see wherein his great strength lies and by what means we may prevail against him that we may bind him to afflict him. Now, another way to say this would be this, that we may control him in order to hurt him. Because in order to hurt him, we need to control him first. Now, when I read that, I just felt like the Holy Spirit just had me stop on it. And he asked me, he said, what's controlling you? What's controlling you? Because it controls you before it hurts you. Well, somebody said, well, it's not hurting now. Well, it's not hurting yet. But did you know God wired you for only one thing to be your Lord? When I say Lord, I mean the thing telling you what to do. You know, you, you know what that one thing is? Him. Like he is to be our only Lord. And what happens is, is that things come in and compete for that lordship where it's like, instead of like me telling television when I'm going to watch it, television becomes my Lord and it's telling me to sit down, what time to sit down, how long to sit down. I'm not turning it off. The only reason why I am is because I fell asleep because television kept me up all night. Like, this thing begins to tell me what to do with my time. Like this thing begins to, you know, interrupt my devotionals. Uh, Maybe in your life you see it like even pulling you away from what is valuable. Like whatever it is that's controlling you, you spend so much time focused on it that you will actually leave a conversation with your children or ignore what they're saying right now to like go watch this or go participate in this or to check and scroll through this. That all of a sudden these things in our life that when they're in their place are amazing. 
And when they're in their place, they're like, great, nothing wrong with television when it's in your control. Nothing wrong with a video game when it's in your control. Nothing wrong with enjoying food when it's in your control. But Paul said, I've noticed, in my life at least, that oftentimes instead of me controlling those things, those things control me. And the reason why I have to wake up to notice like what is controlling me is it controls me before it hurts me. It controls me before it hurts me. And so if I don't want it to hurt me, I need to put my body under and for me to control my body instead of my body controlling me. Can somebody give a clap for that, right? Like, man, why is fasting important? Why is fasting important? Because if I don't put my body under, my body will begin to put me under It controls me before it hurts me. Years ago, I was listening to a man of God preach who was my father's spiritual father. His name was Kenneth E. Hagin. And Brother Hagin, for years, was a minister. For over 60-some-odd years, uh, he traveled around, preached, and taught the Word of God. And just a titan, like a titan of faith. And anyway, I was listening to a preacher one time, and I never forget the story he told. Back in the 60s, he would travel around and preach. And so he would preach meetings from like Monday through Friday, like teach in the morning, teach at night, and he would fast in between. And one day while he was fasting, the Lord spoke to his heart and told him, he said, I'm thankful for these times of fasting. But he said, here's what I want from you. I want you to live a fasted life. A fasted life. He said, well, what do you mean by live a fasted life? And here's how it worked in his context. Here, the Lord spoke to his heart and he said, don't ever clean your plate. Like no matter how good the food is, no matter how tasty it is, no matter how good the pie is, come on somebody, no matter how good the Reese's is, whew, don't clean your plate. Leave a bite, especially when you want it. Now, in our culture today, like, we understand the role that food kind of plays in all of our lives, but I think it's so much more than that, right? It's like, cut the episode off halfway and say, I'll watch the other half tomorrow. Pull away from the game. Like, turn it off and say, you know what, I will catch up on the score tomorrow. Somebody says, well, why in the world would I ever do that? Do you really want that to be your Lord? Do you really want a television show? Are you really coming to that television show and saying, you have more power than I have? Because that's, that's why Jesus is our Lord, is we fully understand, like, he has more authority than us. He has more power than us, more grace than us. I need him for protection. I need him for wisdom. I need him for relief. So Jesus is my Lord. But when all of a sudden I'm allowing something in the world to take the place that only God should take, that it begins to control me because I need it. I just need to relax, and I just need to chill, and I just need some downtime. And God is saying, like, that thing is taking a place that only I should have in your life. And what fasting is is saying, I acknowledge that, God. Like, I acknowledge that this thing has had too strong of a hold on me and my family for way too long, and so forth. Temporarily, I'm going to delete the app. Temporarily, I'm not going to eat the food. Temporarily, I am not going to watch the show. Temporarily, I'm going to put the video game console in the closet. Temporarily, I'm going to pull back from it, if for no other reason alone to show myself and the Lord, I only have one master, and that is the Lord. Lord God Almighty. There is nothing in this world that will make me bow my knee to anything but the Lord God Almighty. I keep under my body. I was reading my favorite book of the Bible, the book of Joel, and I saw this. (laughs) It's a joke. And I saw this when I was reading it. For if you're a visitor, my name is Joel. Uh, So uh, I saw this and uh, it just blessed me. And watch what he says here Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the uh, porch and the altar. And like, when you read the Word of God, you can't just read it. You need to meditate in it. You need to study it. And I couldn't get past that, between the porch and the altar. Not at the porch or at the altar. Between the porch and the altar. And what the porch was was the minister's public life. And what the altar was was the minister's private life. 
And God said, like, I know life has to live, be lived in between. Like, you don't just have a private life, and you don't just have a public life. You got both. But he said, like, you've got to live that life in between. And what happens is, in your life, is life gets crazy. Like, our day gets full, and our public life gets so full, and our mornings get full, and our afternoons get full, and our weekends get full, and our nights get full. And especially, like, if you're in a season where you got, like, kids everywhere running around, it's like, you can't eat that, and you can't pack that for lunch. And, like, at nights, it's like you've got all these schedules and practices. It's like life is full. And what happens is we drift more towards the porch and further and further away from the altar. And then even for relief from the stress of all those things, we still stay on the porch. And what fasting is, is saying like, I understand my life has gotten out of balance, that I have spent far more time in my public life than I have my private one. And what I'm going to do in this season is temporarily, I'm going to get out of balance in the other direction. I am going to begin to sacrifice things in my public life so I can dive into my private life in a more deeper, more intimate, and life-giving way. I'm going to pull away from my activities in the world to press more into God in this season. Number two, second reason, second reason to fast. It brings breakthrough and reward. Uh, Have you ever been famous for something? No. Okay. Well... There are people who were famous for things in Scripture. And in the book of Luke, we see the disciples were famous for something pretty interesting. Watch this. In Luke 5 and verse 33, one day some people came to Jesus and said, John the Baptist's disciples fast, pray regularly, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But why are your disciples always eating and drinking? Like always eating and drinking. Like everybody else is fasting, why aren't they fasting? The disciples were famous for not fasting. And you know what? They were fine for a minute. And maybe in your life it's like, fast? I don't, I don't, I don't fast. You know, now it's so funny. It's like culture has kind of called on to like intermediate fasting and the health benefits of like what intermediate fasting does. And God is like, I have been saying this for like 6,000 years if people could like pay attention. So like in this, like we, we know like fasting is like has some health benefits and those types of things. But maybe like you're even famous for like, I don't fast, Pastor Joel. Neither do the disciples. And you know what? They were okay. And you've probably been okay. They, they were fine, and, and you've probably been fine, until they weren't. And there was a certain moment in their journey with Jesus that is just very, very interesting. They have a guy come to them with an issue, and let's just watch it play out in Scripture. Matthew 17 and verse 15. Lord, have mercy on me. This is the guy now talking to Jesus. For he is a lunatic and sore vexed, and oftentimes he falls into the fire and oftentimes into water. And I brought him unto the disciples, and they could not cure him. So up to this point, they've been fine, not fasting. Like, fine. But they have something come up in life that they don't know what to do. They don't know how to fix it. No matter what they do, it's getting further and further out of control. Uh, They have no power over it. They're stuck at it. They, They can't press through on it. It's like... Why is this not working? It worked in the past. Why is this not working right now? And they are mystified. And so this guy gives up on the disciples and takes his his son over to Jesus. He tells Jesus that, and watch what Jesus does. The story plays out in verse 18. And Jesus rebuked the devil. He departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus and said, Why why couldn't we make progress with this? Now, Now, some of you, now this is big. Some of you, I had this word come up in my heart while we were praying uh, during worship. You're in trouble. Like, trouble. You're in legit trouble right now. And you absolutely need a breakthrough. And nothing in your life is working. And it's like the disciples have this this situation that is so out of control. Like, this, this kid is being thrown into fire and water. There is no control here. And maybe you're in so much trouble, it's like, Pastor Joel, I'm telling you, life has gotten so out 
of control, and we're trying to get it under control, but we're not making any progress. And the disciples asked Jesus, well, why weren't we able to see progress with this? And here's what Jesus said. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing will be impossible to you. Howbeit, this kind will not change or go out, but by prayer and fasting. See, up to this time, they hadn't fasted. They were famous for not fasting. Like, anybody who's religious is fasting. But Jesus, your disciples don't fast. He's like, the time will come. That was basically Jesus' response. The time will come. And you know when the time came? When they came up against something where it's like, this is not working. It's gotten out of control, and we can't get it under control. And Jesus says, I know, this situation can only be changed through prayer and fasting. This situation can only be changed through prayer and fasting. And somebody says, well, why? It doesn't change God. God's not moved by your works. I don't care who you are, God's not moved by works. God's the same before you fast, while you fast, and after you fast. God never changes. But here's what fasting does do. It changes you. There's a story in the Old Testament about these lepers who had a system that worked for them. And it was less than ideal because they were, were lepers, but they had learned to function in their dysfunction. And they're hanging out by a city gate, and people are walking by and giving them food, and so they're, they're always full. Not perfect, but functional. Not great, but manageable. And then an enemy comes in and surrounds that city and shuts off the food supply, not just for them, but for everyone else out in, 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 everyone else in the city. And everybody's getting hungry, and the last thing anybody's going to do is like go outside and feed these lepers. So before, the lepers have a system that works for them, and then something came up that disrupted their routine, shocked their system, broke it, and now they're here, something that they never were before, hungry. They were hungry. And you know what happened when they got hungry? They changed their system. They got up here and said, why are we sitting here so hungry? And they got up and began to march towards the enemy. And while they began to march, God got in those footsteps and brought them a breakthrough and a breakthrough for the city. Now, here's my point. A lot of times in life, we go through the motions spiritually and every other way. And then something comes up and it disrupts our system. It's like life's not working, life's getting dry, and we're finding ourselves in some trouble. And what has happened is, is we've gotten so just rhythmic with life that God's kind of been left on the horizon. And what fasting does is us coming to God and saying, God, I'm going to give you more to work with. I'm going to get up from this little system where I've been waiting on everyone else to take care of me. And I'm going to get up from this place and I'm going to press into you like never before. See, it's like this. We were doing a church tour with a pastor from Maryland a couple of months ago. And he was walking through the church and like we're walking him through and kind of showing him this facility. And he was just blown away. And the builder who built the facility was the one doing the tour with us. And he was going to build this guy's facility. And everything, he's like, I want that, and I want this, and I want this, and I want that, and like, I want that. The thing that he was most impressed with, you'll never be able to guess it. You know what he was most impressed with? Not the screens or the speakers or the lights or the stage or the cafe. The thing that he was most impressed with, you know what it was? The golf carts. He liked our golf carts. Uh, and he's like, can we test drive? I'm like, sure. <laughs> like, so, you know, those kinds of things. So it was amazing. So anyway, he, he's just loving it, absolutely loving it. And the whole time he's loving it, the builder's walking with him, and he's trying to remind him of the cost. Because you can't give him less than what was paid for it and get the same result. And fasting doesn't change God, but it's like coming to a designer and giving him $5,000 versus $500. Do you think a good designer could do more with $5,000 than $500? Because if you can walk around someone else's life and be like, I want that, and I'd like that, and I want their health, and I want their body, and I want their physique, and I want their marriage, and I want all, and it's like, okay, that's great, awesome to want it, but are you willing to pay the price for it? And what fasting does is saying, God, I'm just going to give you more to work with. 
Like in this season of my life, like I'm done with like my cookie cutter Christianity with like my 20 minute devotional here and then make sure I'm here by here and make sure like we'll check back in later in the day and we'll pray over the food. It's like, God, I'm going to pray for the next hour. The time that I would spend playing TV or watching TV or playing that game, I'm going to give it to you, God. The time that I would be on this phone, I'm going to give it to you, God. And guess what? You give God more to work with, God has more to work with, then God can begin to move in your life. Like never before. Nehemiah, when he heard about Jerusalem's broken walls, he went on a fast. God graced him with favor, anointing, and wisdom, and he rebuilt those walls. Esther, before she approached the king, she called for a fast. She gave gave God more to work with, and grace and favor hit her life. Daniel was in a situation where so much pressure, he went on a fast, and God gave him grace and wisdom and prosperity. In all these people's lives in Scripture, you see them call for a fast in their own life, and that fast opened up heaven. None more so than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The first act of his ministry was God sending him on a fast. Now, here's the question I'll ask you today is this. If Jesus could have accomplished all he came to do without fasting, why would he have to fast? If Jesus could have just been Jesus and amazing and done all that God wanted him to do in this life, why would God have to make him fast? I'll tell you why he fasted. He fasted because he knew there were natural things that would only be changed that way. And he goes on this fast, and after it, he comes out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And some of you, that's what you need right now, is you need the power of the Holy Spirit working with you to help you and fix things. And I'm telling you, you give God more to work with, you'll see his power come in your life. Which is why Satan came to Jesus, and the very first temptation was what? Jesus, why don't you just break your fast? Just turn the stone. You know you're hungry. I know you're hungry. Just turn the stone into bread. The the first temptation was break your fast. You know why? Because you're not dangerous to Satan when you're playing a game. And you're not dangerous to his kingdom when you're watching television. And sports are great, but it doesn't make you dangerous. But you start giving up some of those things, and you start hitting your knees and going to war for your family, going to war for the plan of God for your life, going to war for a nation, you become dangerous. And so Satan's like, look, you can do anything. Just break the fast. Like, stop doing that and just give yourself back to some of those things you've been doing because you're cute when you're there, but you're dangerous when you're fasting. You're dangerous when you're praying. When you fast, you see breakthrough. And thirdly, I'll close with this. Number three, here's the third reason. Fasting brings you closer to God and his voice in your life. If you want to hear God, go on a fast. You need, you need God and his presence and his voice to just be rich in your life, it's time to fast. You remember the story of the prodigal son? You have this, this kid, he comes to his father, and he tells him, I want all the money that I would get when you die, I want it right now. He takes the money, and he goes out, and he lives life. You know what life was for a season? It was incredibly full. His life was full. His day was full. His nights were full. His schedule was full. His belly was full. Has your life been full? Any of you just find like there's no shortage of things to do, things you have to do. Life is full. And the whole time his life is getting fuller, he's actually drifting more and more away from God. And some of us, because our schedules are so full, and we've got so much going on in our life, it's like it's been a minute since we've heard from God. It's been a minute since we really felt his presence. It's been a minute since God has been like so incredibly real because life has gotten so full that we haven't realized just how far we've drifted from the house. But you know what? He didn't stay full. And this prodigal son comes to this place where he runs out of money. And when he runs out of money, he runs out of food. And you know what he gets? He gets hungry. I said he gets hungry. And in the story in Luke chapter 15, watch it here in verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my hired servants, servants of my fathers, have bread enough to spare, and here I am perishing with hunger? He said, Here's what I'll do. I'll go back home. Here's what I'll do. I'll go back home. His hunger brought him home. And what happens is, is some of us have gotten so full recently Life's just gotten so busy, and our days are so full with so much stuff 
that we don't realize how far we've drifted. But when you start cutting out some of those things in your life and you start getting hungry again, you know what happens? You cut out television, video games, and a phone. You know what you're going to feel that you haven't felt in a very long time? Bored. You're going to feel incredibly bored. It's like, what do I do? And God's like, I'll tell you what you do. Come to me. Come home. Come to the Father. Come to worship. Come to prayer. Spend an hour in the Word of God. Come unto me. And you know what happened when the prodigal son came home? The first thing the father said is it's time to fill him up. Slay the fatted calf. You know what that's symbolic of? It's symbolic of God speaking to your heart. They came to Jesus one day and like, Jesus, master, please eat. Please eat. Because they saw like he had eaten in a minute. Like, Jesus, please eat. And he said, I have meat that you know not of. I have meat that you know not of. He said, my meat is to hear from the Lord and to do what he tells me to do. And I find that just far more filling. And I want to encourage you in your life, like don't fill up your life with so much stuff that you don't hunger and thirst after God, hunger and thirst after a word, hunger and thirst after God's presence, hunger and thirst after God. You got to speak to me through this Bible. You got to speak to me through this church service. You got to speak to me in this moment. Like fasting will introduce like such a disruption to your life that it's like, I got to eat, I got to eat, I got to eat, I got to eat. I need something to chew. I need something hot. And God's like, take all of that to me. You've been using that as your crutch for so long. Take all of that to me. I'll give you grace that will sustain you. I'll give you power that sustains you. And you learn that God really is your source for everything in life. It's like coming to the lame man and asking, do you want to be made well? Well, if you do, you've got to get rid of that cane. You've got to get rid of those crutches that have been holding you up. If you really want to be made well, you've got to let go of these other things that you have been using as your support system. I think God is saying for so long, these things have been your support system. These hobbies have been your support system. These things, have you've used it to relieve your stress. You've used it to like re- relieve your interest. Like these things have become something that only I should be. And if you really want to be made well, let's get rid of your crutches. Let's get rid of your beggar's coat. Let's get rid of these things that you've been relying on for so long. And come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, stressed out, irritable, and I will give you rest. Just come unto me. This year, I want you to live a fasted life. Not just a fasted month or 21 days, and those things are good, but what I want is for you to live a fasted life, to just clear out a little bit more of your life, to give more of your life to the Lord Jesus than ever before. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for each and every person who's here. And Lord, I just thank you in all of their lives that you're just at work both to will and to do your good pleasure. And Father, I I thank you for every person here under the sound of my voice that so many of them are going through just trouble. And Father, I know that you're an ever-present help in a time of trouble. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, Pastor Joel, I've been in trouble. And I I know in my trouble, I have just drifted from Jesus. I've drifted from the Father's house. I've drifted. I've been so full of concern, so full of worry and anxiety, of just trying to figure it all out. I know what I need today is Jesus. I need to give my life to Jesus or rededicate my life to Jesus. And if you're here and you say, that's me, Pastor, here's what I want you to do. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed, no one's looking around. If that's you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to lift your hand all over this place right now, all over this place. Somebody says, what, what the, does it matter if I lift my hand? You better believe it matters. It's a sign of surrender unto Jesus. Hands going up all over the room. Amazing, 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 amazing. Now, everyone in here, just pray this prayer with me. You can repeat it after me. Just say, dear Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for your grace and your mercy. You are my ever-present help in a time of trouble. 
And I thank you, Father, that Jesus is my good shepherd, and he will see me through this. I'm coming out of trouble. I'm coming back to you. I look unto you, Father. You're where my help is coming from. And I thank you, Lord. All of my past, all of my trouble, all of my sin, it's being washed away by the blood of Jesus. And today, I boldly declare, this is the beginning of the best year of my life, the best decade of my life, and the best days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give it up for everyone who made a decision today. So amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this YouTube channel. I want to encourage you to subscribe to the link if you haven't already for more weekly content that I'm sure is going to be a blessing to you as well. Click the link below if you would like to partner with us to help us get this message out to even more people. Thank you so much for your generosity. We'll see you next week.